want to welcome those of you this morning who may uh, be visiting with us. My name is Seth Hankey, and I'm the pastor here at Greenmont Fellowship, and it's just wonderful to have you with us on this Resurrection Sunday. And uh, we're here today because God's rewritten our story, right? And our story now includes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's made us new people, and uh, he's, given them us, he's given us a new purpose uh, because of what he's done through his son, Jesus. So uh, what, what a great time for us to stop each year and remember uh, what God has done uh, through the power of, of his son. So uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be turning there in just a few moments, but uh, I want to tell you a little story this morning as we get started about a tourist. And this tourist was visiting a little country church in Germany. When they looked up and there on the steeple in front of them, they noticed a carved figure of a lamb. So as they saw this lamb, they asked someone who was there on the grounds why the lamb was placed where it was up on top of the steeple. And they were told that when the church was originally being built, there was a safety rope that had broken while a man was working up on the steeple, and he had plunged to the ground. His co-workers ran down, rushing and expecting to find him dead, but miraculously, the man had survived the fall with just minor cuts and bruises. Turned out that the man had landed directly on top of a lamb that was grazing there below <laughs> in the church. What are the chances? The lamb broke the man's fall and in the process saved his life, even though the lamb was crushed under his weight and killed. And in gratitude for the lamb saving his life, the workmen crawled up into the steeple and carved a lamb there at the exact place from which he had fallen so far. What an amazing story. And this morning, I want to talk to us about the life-saving power of the lamb. I want to talk about the power of the lamb First Peter says these words to us, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or without defect. Amen? Now, I'm not God. Um, I don't know about you. When, when I think about the kind of animal, or I imagine an animal that could probably save my life. I, I typically think of an animal like this. I don't know if you can see this in front of you. Um, these animals, to me, appear to be rather fierce and fast and put the fear in their, put the fear in the heart of any potential threat that they might encounter. But yet God, in his perfect will, didn't choose any of these animals for what he was about to do and accomplish. Instead, he chose an animal that was the epitome of weakness and the epitome of innocence. He chose a fluffy little white lamb. This lamb screams, cuddle me, Seth, cuddle me. Not, I'm going to save you and rescue you. How many of you know, though, that God's ways are very different than our ways? The things that we conceive of in our minds to save us are different than the things that God has in mind. Revelation chapter 13, God says that Jesus is the Lamb of God that was slain from the creation of the world. Before people ever walked the earth, before humanity ever existed, God had already determined to display his glory through his Son, becoming a man and dying on a cross for sinners. God's lamb was a slain as a sacrifice for your sins, for mine, and so he alone is able to provide salvation for you and for me today. And so I want to ask you to consider this morning. I want to invite you to consider the life-saving power of the lamb of God for your life. 2,000 years ago, there was a man, and his name was John the Baptist. And God sent John to prepare Israel for the Messiah, the arrival of Jesus Christ. And one day, John was out. He was ministering, 
And the Bible says that he looked up and he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When was the last time that you had someone (laughs) respond to your arrival in this fashion? Behold, Peter! Peter! It's a little over the top, isn't it? And yet, see, John was so excited because he wanted to attract people's attention to Jesus. Because for centuries, people had been looking for and waiting and anticipating the one who was promised to come and address the issue of Israel's sin. And John was in that moment saying, hey, guys, behold, the waiting is finally over. It is the Lamb of God that we have been waiting for. He's right there in front of you. And maybe not everyone shared John's excitement or enthusiasm that day. Maybe not everyone understood exactly what was happening in that moment. But John saw that something so significant in Bible fulfillment was happening, that the Lamb of God had stepped into history. We need to understand some backstory to this to help us understand even more why John responded the way he did. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to fix the problem of their sin, you'll remember, by taking some leaves and tying them together and sewing them to cover themselves. There was a problem, though, a big problem. And the problem is that their attempt to cover their own sin in their own way was unacceptable to God. Their attempt to cover their sin was insufficient. So Genesis 3 says God had to kill an animal himself and shed its blood in order to provide an acceptable covering for Adam and Eve. Their covering had to be made through the taking of a life. And in this way, God was teaching them an important lesson, that someone had to die for their sins. That blood had to be shed, not just leaves tied together in a makeshift effort to cover themselves. See, Hebrews 9.22 says this, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. A life must be taken in order for the shame, the penalty of our sinfulness to be taken care of and to be covered. And so fast forward from this moment of Adam and Eve ineptly trying to cover for their own sins to the moment of the night of Israel's escape from 400 years of slavery under Pharaoh. It's on this night that we read in chapter 12 of Exodus that the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. And if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. If you know the story, you know that up until this point, God had been pouring out his wrath against Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt and on Egypt itself, and he brought nine very intense plagues against them. But now God was winding up, and he was about to bring one terrible, final, tenth judgment by taking the life of every firstborn person and animal in Egypt. And in preparation for this terrible moment of judgment against Egypt, God came to Israel and spoke to them and said that for them to bypass this moment of judgment, that they would need to have a lamb. They needed to bring one lamb into the household for each family. We read in verse 5, The animals that you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or from the goats, but take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. 
Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. So each family had to choose a lamb that was one year old, that was without defect, and they had to take this little lamb into their home on the 10th day and care for it and get to know it. And maybe the kids even named it over the course of those five days. It became a part of the family. It became personal. And then after those five days, God said that the entire family, the kids and the parents, were to gather and bring out little Fluffy and kill the lamb and apply its blood to the door frames of the house. Talk about a very potent image of God's judgment and God's mercy on sin. And everything that we, in an Exodus verse 12, verse 12, it said, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And all these things that we just read about happened just as God decreed. The people of Israel killed a lamb and painted them on their doorposts. And when the death angel came to kill the firstborn of the rebellious Egyptians, God saw the blood of the lamb over their door, house, door frames, and he passed over them. He passed over them. And the blood of the Passover lamb averted God's just judgment and redeemed Israel out of slavery in Egypt. But you see, the blood of those lambs that were killed in those houses, they were never sufficient to fix the real problem of sin. They were never meant to fix the problem of sin. See, Hebrews speaks to this issue and says, those sacrifices, the ones, the animal sacrifices, are an annual reminder of sins, but it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. If it worked to, to just sacrifice bulls and goats and lambs, why did Jesus ever need to come? He didn't need to come. We could just sacrifice an animal every time we violate God's law, but it was never enough because it was never designed to be enough. Only the blood of the true Passover lamb could ever provide forgiveness of sins and redemption for all those who would believe in Jesus Christ. See, the reason that we're talking about this this morning, the reason that we have an Easter, the reason that we have a Passover lamb is because we have a problem. And the problem, the Bible says, is sin. It is sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It would be probably nice for some of us if God measured us according to our neighbors or some of our family members, but God doesn't measure us according to other people. He measures us according to himself and according to his holy standards, and we fall so far short of his standards. If you and I were to try to swim to Hawaii, you might swim further than me, a lot further. <laughs> but at some point, we're both going to drown on the way to Hawaii because it's too far of a distance. And that's the distance between us and a perfect God, between a perfect God and sinful humanity. It's too far for us to close that gap because we have fallen so far short of God's standard. And there's nothing that we can do to make up for it, to pay the price to satisfy God's perfection. We are dead meat, and that's all there is to it. 
See, Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. That's what the math equation is for all of us in this room. All of our sins, whether you think they're little white sins or black sins or what level of sins they are, all of our sins equal death. But here's the great news this morning. There's a but in the sentence. But the free gift of God available to everyone is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, all the daily, all the annual sacrifices that Israel made for hundreds and hundreds of years could never take away their sins. They were a picture or a type pointing to Jesus, pointing to him as the one who could satisfy that perfect standard that God alone has. And the Old Testament looked forward to the day when God would provide this very permanent solution to the issue of our sin. One perfect lamb offered as a substitutionary atonement for the sin of everyone. It doesn't make sense that one person could atone for the sins of everyone in the entire world. There was a prophet His name was Isaiah. He lived 700 years before the time of Jesus. And he got a glimpse of what God was about to do. And he gave us a description of what this perfect lamb of God was going to be like. This suffering servant who would come like a lamb to the slaughter and bear the iniquity of all of humanity. We read these these words in verse 4 of Isaiah 53. Surely he... This lamb took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows, and yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him, and by his wounds we receive healing and are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So Isaiah says, I want you to look 700 years into the future. And we meet John the Baptist that day. And John breaks onto the scene and says, everybody behold, the Lamb of God. We have found him. He is the perfect substitute. And he's not just the Lamb. He's the Lamb of God. That means that he is God's solution to our problem, not my solution to our problem, because my solution would be quite different than God's solution. You see, the Lamb of God had to be perfect, and Jesus was perfect. He qualified. The Lamb of God had to be a human, and so Jesus became a man, a perfect man. And Hebrews 2 says, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And so that means that the death of Jesus Christ, it's so sufficient that it addressed every sin of every person who has ever lived and will ever live for all of time. Isn't that amazing? And the Bible declares that Jesus, in this act of offering himself, reconciled the world to himself. And Jesus bore your sin and my sin and the sins of your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren. All of those sins have been paid for by the Lamb of God on the cross so that he can reconcile all of humanity to himself. Do you remember the last words of Jesus as he was on the cross? He yelled out, it is finished. Tetelestai, 
It means it is paid in full. The sin, the debt that we owe was paid in full when Jesus died on the cross at Calvary. So do you want to hear some good news? Do you want to hear what that means for you? What that means for our everyday life that we live? For starters, it means that we can exchange our sinfulness for Jesus' righteousness. I don't do anything well or right or good. There's nothing good in me. But there is Jesus, and I am righteous because of him. 2 Corinthians 5 says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the great exchange that makes absolutely no sense, but it is ours by faith in Christ Jesus. In the Chinese language, the character for the word righteousness is formed by putting together two characters, one on top of the other. The top character is the character for the word lamb, and the bottom character is the character for the word me or myself or I. And when you put these together, the lamb and me, the word righteousness is formed. points to the reality that true righteousness comes by placing yourself under the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who is our covering. He is our righteousness. Isn't that amazing? Because of Jesus' atonement and his victory over sin on the cross, you and I received a credit transfer. God took the perfect, righteous credit score of Jesus and he transferred that perfect credit score to whoever would receive Jesus Christ by faith. I'll take that. I'll take perfect credit. And Jesus says, it's yours. It's yours by believing in what, what I've done for you. My righteousness for your filthy rags. If you'll come under me and receive me, my righteousness will be yours. But it gets even better. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 3, he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in verse 24, church, he says, and they are justified by his grace as a gift. They are justified. Can you say justified this morning? Now, my kids are excited because they're going to get some gifts a little bit later today. Some of you guys have traditions where you give gifts on Easter. I like that tradition. I think one year I got a bike on Easter. My parents loaded up on Easter. It was like almost better than Christmas for us as kids. But I don't know about what you or what kind of family you come from, but we don't have to earn the gifts that we get in our family. My kids don't have to go shovel snow or mow the lawn before I invite them in to receive their gifts. They're free. See, once you start working and trying to earn something, it becomes a wage. You see, God gives us a gift, and he makes us justified by the perfect life of the Lamb. Justif justified means to be, to be declared legally innocent. It's like a judge saying to you as you stand there with all of your misdemeanors and fines and all of the things that you've done, hey, you know what? I find you not guilty. You're free to go. And you say, what in the world? How? Okay. Jesus says, I see you. I see all of the things you've done, that whole trail of terrible things. And I want to let you know, I find you not guilty. You are free to go. See, when a sinner believes on Jesus, they're declared not guilty because of a righteousness transfer, a transfer to your account. So even though we might be guilty as sin, God says not guilty because he looks at Christ and he exonerates you and he exonerates me. That's justification, church. And it's because of what Jesus did as the perfect spotless lamb of God. But it gets even better. I feel like a, a, a TV marketer. Then Paul comes to the next verse. And he says in Romans 24, 
It's through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. See, we not only have justification, but we have redemption through Jesus Christ. Redemption means to release through the payment of a price. I want you to envision a slave trade where slaves would be put up on a block and they would be purchased. And redemption means that the slave was bought and purchased and then set free and released by someone. And so to redeem something is to to pay a price for it in order to release it and let it go. So God said, you guys are justified, you are righteous, and I am setting you free of your sin and your past so that you can live the life that I've called you to live in my son Jesus. You can't afford to pay the price anyways. So I picked up the price tag. Just go and be free to live in me. Justification, righteousness, redemption. And Paul says in verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's a big theological word. It basically just means satisfaction. To be propitiated means to be satisfied. So when we say that Jesus was set forth as a propitiation, we mean that he satisfied the just demands of a holy God with his substitutionary atonement on our behalf. God said, I'm satisfied. What you have done, my son, has satisfied all of my holy demands. So I reconcile now through you the world to myself because of what you've done. See, church, these are all ours in Christ Jesus. These are all things that we could never afford, we could never do on our own, we could never even conceive of doing, but God in his infinite mercy before the foundations of the world had it so that the lamb was slain on our behalf, so that God could build a bridge back to himself, so that he could restore us to Eden, so that we could live forever with him and rule and reign to the original charter that he designed us for. See, that is what is ours And I have to say that so often I live very far below what is credited to my account. Oftentimes, because of the voice of the evil one, who, by the way, was crushed, God went and preached to those who were in chains, and he gave the beat down to the devil and broke his power over us. So all he can do is he can slander us and he can deceive us. And God says, he ain't got nothing on you. I broke his power over your life and set you free and redeemed you. Child, you're free. But how many of us live far below what God has purchased for us through his son on the cross? And though we say that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, we live more as people who work out our way. Oh, God, I messed up. I guess I'm going to have to read my Bible for 10 minutes today. <laughs> oh, man, I, three Hail Marys, four of this. What, God, I don't know what I'm going to do to make up for all the things that I do. And God said, it's already been paid for. Just step into the place of belief. Be under the Lamb. Experience the righteousness that is yours by faith. It's by faith, church, that it's ours. We have to take hold of it by faith. So tomorrow morning when you wake up, you have to say, I am set free by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. You may not feel free. You may not feel righteous or justified. But you stand up in faith and you say, that is who I am because of what Jesus has done. And his his blood has not lost the power. And it will never lose its power. And so what is our response to him? For all that he's done for us. See, people miss heaven not because they're sinful, because you and I are sinful. People miss heaven because they refuse to accept by faith what Jesus has done for them and for their sins. They choose to live on their own merit. They choose to live in rebellion toward God, and they say, God, I'll do it myself. I'll make up my own religion if I have to, but I will not bring myself to saying that I'm a sinner or that I need God 
I need a good counselor. I need a healthy self-image. And God is saying, oh, you need a proper, you need a proper understanding of who you really are, child. You are broken and fallen, and there's nothing good in you. But I'm here. I stand at the door and knock. And I have provided everything that, that needs to happen in order for you to be reconciled to the Father. There's a really interesting passage in Exodus 12. It says this, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. See, God says, the lambs are here. They've been provided for. You, you got to kill them. Drain the blood into the basin. But here's the step of obedience and faith on your part. You take the hyssop and you apply it to the doorframe of your houses. You have to take the blood and apply it. It is a step of faith. It is an action step on your part in obedience to what God has called you to. Oftentimes, people know the truth, that the blood has been supplied, that there is a lamb, but they won't apply it to their life. They won't take that step and say, I am bringing my life under the lamb. I am asking that you come and that you are my righteousness. And I believe that God wants us to be people who walk in step with him, who apply the blood of the lamb over our lives and not allow it just to sit latent in a bowl or a basin, but to be people who live by faith every day. You know, Church, we, we, you might have heard this sermon five times before in your life. You might have heard about the Lamb of God. You might have heard that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus forgave your sins. And, and just like me, oftentimes they just sound like a long list of things that I know up here. But it is by faith that we step into the reality of this life, of following God. It's by faith that we say, Jesus, you are my righteousness. Jesus, I am justified in you. And Jesus, that person has experienced your righteousness. They don't owe me anything. Because they too have been set free and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for what he has provided for us through his son, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we have a message to share we have a hope in our hearts that will never disappoint us because of the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word and for the reminder that it was a lamb, a perfect lamb, who came, who came to, on our behalf, suffer and die to reconcile us to you. Lord, we today stand in faith in what you have done for us. We pray that, Lord, this week we would live more deeply in that reality of being justified sons and daughters, redeemed and set free, that we are no longer beholden to our past or to the deceiver and his lies, but we are who you say that we are. So I pray that you would strengthen your church pray, Jesus, that you would fill them with faith, that you would help them to hear your voice and to walk in obedience to all that you call them to this week. We pray these things in your name and all God's people said, amen.